Hello and welcome to CIS 1300. Uh, today I'll be talking about forms. All right, now let's get into it. Uh, so while I'm talking about forms, let's go over what kind of things I'm going to talk about about forms. Uh, first, forms themselves, then uh, the attributes of forms, get and post method, and then some form inputs, labels, text areas, select, and we'll, I'll go over uh, a couple of live examples as well, including um, both plain HTML and Dreamweaver. Uh, so first, what is a form? I'm sure everybody has seen a form online before, but uh, on the off chance that you haven't, a form is a way for you to collect information from the users directly. They type it in, they press submit at the bottom, uh, and then you collect all this information. The simplest one is going to be just a, a, an email for maybe an email mailing list. That's the simplest form uh, you can perhaps make. Uh, there are much more complex forms, multi-page forms. Uh, we'll go over today um, somewhere in the middle there, uh, like my example right here, okay? Uh, so this example, uh, I've kind of just made just some fake stuff in here for uh, somebody uh, for an, an essay competition or, or whatnot, where people are going to submit an essay that they've written uh, with some contact information in case they win. You can be contacted again. Uh, an age group and a genre is also in there. Um, so the, the form element itself basically consists of uh, just the the, um, uh, the open brace there, word form, and then the form is going to have to have both an action and a method. Uh, and then all the elements are going to go inside of it, and the form will be closed at the end. So I've linked the uh, Mozilla page. Uh, I won't go over the documentation for uh, the form itself. Um, let's talk about what the action and the methods are first. Uh, forms by themselves do nothing. They don't actually collect the information and parse it and process it out and put it on your server in a database. Forms don't do that. Uh, they are a method to transmit that information, but there must be some other program on the receiving end uh, that's going to get that information and then process it, maybe send it in an email or collect it into a database or both, um, or, or whatever processing is going to happen. And that is what the action is. You put the uh, URL, either a full or a relative URL, uh, of the file, um, so it's going to be formaction.php or, or something to that effect. Uh, so whatever that action, the action is the URL of the file that will process your form. Uh, and then the method, uh, there's two methods, get and post, that uh, is your, your choices there. Um, if you've ever been to... Uh, any kind of website that has the URL and then there's a question mark and then there's looks like there's some variables and stuff. There's like uh, G equals one, two, three, X equals four, five, six, all kinds of random stuff like that. Usually it's it looks random because uh, they try to shorten it as much as possible. Um, other times it may look like it's actually saying things like name equals this and uh, ID equals this. They, they, could be human readable to some extent. Um, so that's the get method where when the form is submitted, it's sent, it's actually written right into the URL. All the values of the form will be written into there. Um, and those URL parameters are not unique only for forms, they are used for a lot of other stuff as well. Um, uh, and uh, uh, we'll get into that in the next slide. Um, post method uh, is kind of the opposite. It's going to leave, leave a clean URL. The post variables are uh, submitted in the request, the actual request when the URL is, is sent. Um, so it's, it's hidden from the user. Uh, a low-level hacker can still access that and change that, so it's definitely not secure, uh, but it is hidden from the average users. 
Uh, so get, I have a, just an example of get right here. I submitted my form, my example form via get while I was building it. And so here's all the values. So I have the URL, um, the action URL. I just had it action to itself to example.htm, uh, which you can do that. You can have the, uh, the code that is going to execute can be in the same page itself and it will refresh itself with that get parameter or post parameter um, and then execute from there. Uh, that's that's very common as well. It doesn't take the user anywhere else. It just refreshes the page with those values that they inputted. Um, the nice part about that is you don't have to separate the page from the code into two different files. You can programmatically put them all into one file. Um, you have the code execute, and if the code executes, you can then choose to display different content in your page as well. Um, all of that is not uh, part of this class, but now you know that that's something that, that can be done, and uh, for a long time it was very popular with the um, content, the, uh, content management systems in that uh, it's a little bit less used now because the, the systems are a little bit bigger than that um, but still uh, very easy to do um, let's get let's have a look at uh, a couple of these get parameters so name dash f that's the first name box in my example right here first name last name email address so name dash f equals j just type dj uh, ampersand denotes that it's going to go to the next value name dash l equals Blank, I left it blank, there's nothing there. There's not a space, nothing, right? Um, web URLs do not like spaces, okay? Um, ampersand secret field, which you can't see in here. I have a hidden field, you can do hidden fields. I'll show you that. Uh, secret field equals one, two, three, X, Y, Z. That's pre-programmed, the user cannot change the secret field. Not normally, okay? Um, a very low level hacker will know how to do it. Uh, but the average user doesn't. They can't see it. They won't do it. Uh, next is email equals. Left that blank as well when I submitted it. Um, age group equals mid adult. And if you can see here, the age. Yes. So radio buttons uh, are very useful when you want to force the user to select only one uh, of something. Um, and then I have some of these other ones on here, which I'll talk about each of those as we get to them. Okay. Um, right. So uh, last note that I have here on the get method is uh, not just for forms, but outside of forms, the get method is widely popular for uh, giving individuals unique URLs. So uh, a very common tool for that is uh, if you have to reset your password, you put in your, your email address into a form, select that you want to reset your password, they send an email to your address uh, with a link in there with a really long URL parameter at the end. Uh, and this is some encoded value in there, maybe even um, works for a short amount of time when you click it, it takes you to that that plain URL with a question mark and URL parameter at the end uh, that will be uh, processed programmatically and you'll be able to reset your password. So um, one form will send the information probably via post. Uh, you don't no need to see that. They'll process it, send you an email with a URL with a get with a URL parameter at the end, and you'll go in and that'll process and there'll be another form in there. Um, we won't do that today as well, um, but that is a cool thing to know about the get method. Right? Next, the post method. I have mentioned that the post method is naked at the end. All right, there's gonna be no URL parameters for the post method. Um, it's nice because it keeps your URLs nice and clean. They're not ugly with all that extra crap on the end. Um, but uh, users can't bookmark URLs with all that stuff because that all the stuff could be useful, uh, but it's gone. It doesn't exist in there. Um, 
which is fine. Uh, definitely uh, a choice to be made between the two. Um, if somebody does bookmark a page uh, and it's using the post method either for a form or uh, not a form, the post method can be used for other things as well, just like the get method. Um, the, the bookmark won't carry over any of their unique information. It will be a clean refresh of that page. Um, also very useful in some instances. The, the post method uh, is invisible, but not unhackable. There are programs out there you can hijack the post variable, change it to whatever you want it to be, and then submit and send whatever values you want. Uh, maybe values that didn't necessarily, uh, weren't necessarily going to be allowed otherwise uh, can be manually typed in by a hacker. It's more like a script kitty, though. Uh, but it's not unheard of that, that a, a good hacker would do that as well. Um, so that's the post method. And moving on, a uh, lot of different input types. Okay, on the left here in the green, I have all of the different input types. You can have buttons, checkboxes. Checkboxes are, um, you see the little square boxes, the user clicks on them, and they can click one, zero, one, or more checkboxes in the choice. So if you have any choices for them to make uh, where they can pick zero, one, or more, um, checkbox is the ideal solution. They cannot enter their own unique values into a checkbox. Um, so you have to give them all the potential options in there. Um, so that is one limitation. You cannot have an infinite amount of options in the checkbox uh, unless you were to program some sort of JavaScript response where they can type in their own and then check it. Um, that's a possibility. Uh, so there's also a color picker. Uh, a date picker, date time, date time local. There's also a week and a month and not a day. Um, uh, those are nice. I will uh, go over a date. Uh, you can assume that the week and the month are similar, just not uh, the full date. Uh, email, which is very useful. It's a, it's a somewhat recent add-on to the input types. Uh, it's more powerful than a plain text because the browser will force the email to be written as an email. Um, you'll have to put some value, an at symbol, some other value, and a dot, something. It'll have to be in an email format. Uh, otherwise, it won't submit. So if they type in their email wrong, they forget the at symbol or whatnot, the form won't submit, and it'll say this thing automatically. You don't have to program it. You said this. Uh, this field uh, doesn't have an email set in it properly. Uh, super useful. Uh, in the old days, you would have to use regular expressions and JavaScript and figure out if the email was accurate uh, and then send a message back to the user somehow saying, hey, you didn't type your email in correctly. Um, now it's all done for you because email is open standard. Uh, so pretty awesome that that's in there. Uh, next. File input, you can have people upload files. I'm sure you've uploaded a file on the internet before. That's done with a form. Um, if you are uploading files, you need to be fully aware of your the security of that, for one, the potential amount of server space that uh, will be taken up by uploading files, and the maximum single file size that your server could upload. Okay, so the file one is a big, uh, potential problem, okay, I would not recommend anyone allow file uploads uh, unless they absolutely had to and they absolutely knew what they were doing. Um, hidden fields are next, so those up, uh, they don't look like anything, they're invisible. Uh, they operate pretty much just like your text box, um, where it's, it, you can imagine it as a text box, it has a value uh, and its type is hidden. That's Pretty much all you'll have in the in the hidden fields. You can require them. There are some other options that you have in there. Um, they kind of always operate the same anyway. Uh, and you can use these uh, with JavaScript. You can force uh, 
some values to be processed without the user even having to interact with the form, uh, at least not for that value, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, hidden fields are often used. Um, if the user is logged in already, you know who they are. Uh, you can put whatever information you want about that user into a hidden field. They don't have to fill it out. Then they just press the submit button. You process it. Uh, you, you do have to rely on human action to submit it, but you can, uh, any information that you already know about them, you can just totally make it invisible to them and just submit it and away you go and uh, make things very user friendly for, uh, for folks. Um, next is image, uh, which is uh, similar to the file. Uh, specifically, it's going to be an image though. Um, next is month, which I mentioned before, goes along with the date. Uh, and then numbers, which are uh, kind of a double-edged sword. They're a bit good and bad. The number input gives you uh, a short text box with an up and down arrow. Um, you have some options in there as to what kind of numbers are allowed uh, and what the step is when somebody hits the up and down arrows. Um, the downside is if the user hits the up and down arrows to do it, they're just going to, let's say they're on number one and they want to get to 99, they're going to scroll all the way one number at a time all the way up to 99. They can type in the numbers, uh, but if they don't realize it right away, then it's going to waste a lot of their time. Um, and they're going to be like, what's going on with this stupid form? Um, so numbers are less useful. Uh, it is nice, be the, nicer than text for the simple fact that it does only allow numbers written in it, which is very nice. Um, but on the post-processing, uh, it's usually fairly trivial to run some sanitization function that will make sure that it's only a valid number anyway. Uh, those are widely available. They're in place in all kinds of content management systems already, if that's what you're using. Um, so the number becomes a little bit less useful the more robust the system already is. Uh, next is the password field. Um, and I'm going to, all these are in alphabetical order, so uh, password field is next. It is very uh, just like the text field, except as you're typing in, you just get uh, either a dot or an asterisk. It's kind of system dependent. Um, and nobody can see the contents of it. You can't copy and paste from password fields either. Um, they're, they're hidden visually from, from users, so very useful uh, for passwords, obviously. Um, next is the radio buttons, which I have in here as well. I have a couple of these other ones in here as well, but radio buttons is this or the age group uh, where you're forcing the user to select one out of the of this. They can only pick one in radio button. Next is range, where it actually gives you a slider. I think I have one here in, not in the screenshot, but I do have one in the example where it's actually a slider. Um, downside of range is this, it is the slider and they can drag the slider uh, left and right, but it doesn't tell you what the value is. It doesn't tell the user what the value is. Uh, on the back end, you can select the min and the max and the step value between each one. So you can say it's a, a a min of one, a max of 10, and a step of one, and it gives them an option of one through 10. Uh, or you can have a min of zero, max of 100, and the step is 25, and maybe zero, 25, 50, 75, 100. Those would be your options. Um, does not display the value to the user. Um, if you want to display the value to the user in some way, you'll have to use um, a JavaScript solution and you'll get the value programmatically and then display it in an alternate box somewhere. Um, that alternate box will probably be non-writable to the user and force them to drag. Uh, if you allow them to write in it, they'll inevitably try to write something that was probably outside of the range that you defined was the range. Um, so if you're going to go that route, don't let them input it through the alternative box, make sure that they are forced to use the range. Uh, next is the reset button, which as you might guess, resets the form back to all the default values or blank if there is no default value. Um, I, would, I would 
encourage you to not put a reset button on any form longer than uh, something that would take a person a minute to fill out. Um, if the user spent more than a minute filling out part of your form and they hit the reset button by accident, they're going to be unhappy. Um, so I would not put a reset button in forms that take any, any amount of time uh, because it's going to erase all the values that they put in there. Uh, they are pretty useful uh, for that purpose, uh, but they can also be just as annoying for the same reason. Uh, there's a, a search button, which I don't actually use the search button, so we'll, we'll, we'll try that out in an example. Um, the submit button, which is the final button usually found at the bottom when the user submits their form, they're finished with it, they send it off. Uh, you can change the text in there. It doesn't have to say submit. The button type will be submit, or the input type will be submit. Um, telephone, much like email, it's a, it's a text input box, but it's forced to be the amount of numbers in a telephone number. Uh, it also does some placeholders in there so that it's formatted to look like a telephone number as well. Very convenient. Uh, text box is the most common input field you'll ever see. Uh, just like this example here with the first name and the last name, it's a simple one line input text box. They can write any string of characters that they want from there. They can write any length of characters. The box will just kind of drag along. You can uh, force this to be uh, some lesser value instead of an infinite number of characters um, or not. That's your choice when you're, when you're building it. Uh, time, uh, much like telephone and email, uh, URL, same deal and week what I mentioned earlier when I was talking about date. Right, so uh, those are all of those. Uh, there are a couple that are not input types, text area uh, and select, which I will go over. They are not one of the inputs though. They have their own element type. Um, <clears throat> and then these common ones I have here, which I've already talked about in this full list, these are the, the most common ones and these are the ones that are all in my example. Some of the less common ones I'm not gonna go over in this video. So let's move right along to labels. Labels are very important. Um, <clears throat> every input field should have a label to tell the user what that field is for. Uh, the way you program the label, if you're doing it in Dreamweaver, uh, Dreamweaver takes care of this for you, but if you're doing it by hand, you have to put a for value right here a for value in the label. So on this line, I have label for password field, and then the text is password, end label. And my input of type password, my ID is password field. The name is also password field, which um, I did not go over during the, the inputs, uh, but I will now. Uh, the ID and name, name is new uh, to you, to us. Uh, IDs we've used before, and this is how the, the, the for and the label links up. So the for is for this ID. Name is what the form actually uses when it submits the information to the server. Um, so it doesn't use the ID. Generally, it's very common for the name and the ID to be the same, uh, but there's no requirement of that. Okay. Um, the name can be anything, can be your encoded value. So I could have name be P for password. That's that's acceptable. Um, you know, it's not very descriptive, so I wouldn't recommend it, but it's certainly acceptable. Um, and then the ID is whatever the ID is. This is the same ID that we've been using before for on-page links uh, or for powerful CSS rules with, uh, uh, with a high level on them. Um, uh, high specificity. Um, so that's the same ID we've used, been using before. Um, and that's what the label keys in on as well, because just like the on-page links that we had before, we're using IDs. The labels for value also goes to the ID. Uh, you can almost think of it as an on-page link. It's just a label that links up with the ID value. Okay, And then I have a image of a password field right here. The label is there. Uh, 
the very the second very useful feature of labels if your for value is set correctly to the name uh, excuse me to the id i said it backwards to the id of the input field um, then when the user clicks on the word that's in the label the cursor will then go to whatever that input field is um, you generally text boxes text fields um, if you've ever been on an internet form uh, most of them hopefully if you click on the word the cursor will go into that box the corresponding box um, if the form was not programmed very well and the for value is either not present or just doesn't line up uh, when you click on the text nothing happens because you're just clicking on text no nothing no action takes place uh, and then you have to click into the box which most people generally click in the box anyway but now that you know that this is what labels do you're probably 10 times more likely to click on the labels in the future when you get to a form because like me you might be curious hey did they program this good can i do better than them i don't know let's let's click and find out i'm always doing that um just curious how well these things are programmed every once in a while i get one that doesn't work but most of them do most people know what they're doing um which is very well uh you may have noticed this little icon right here this little key with the red x in there in the password field that's that's not normal um on my browser, I have a, a, a add-on on my browser for an app called KeyPass, uh, which is a password database encryption tool uh, that I use for my password. It's much like LastPass or, or OnePass or one of those, any one of those things, uh, except it's a fully open source solution and it, the program runs locally on your machine. So you could save the encrypted database into something like a Dropbox or something. Um, and you can use your own this. I recommend it to anyone who likes one of these other ones. Uh, it's There are versions of it that are compatible with every operating system that I'm aware of, so it's very nice. Uh, but that's what that is. That is not going to happen for everybody. That's fairly unique to my setup. Uh, not too many people are using KeyPass or the KeyPass browser extension in the Firefox browser. Uh, not many people are using that these days either. So that's labels, and next I have the text area. Uh, text area is very similar to the input text, uh, except the text area is multi-line text. Okay, very useful, especially for my essay example where people have to submit an essay, although my example submission only has one line, uh, but it can have multiple lines, and I have some Leave the code up here. Still going to have an ID and a name, uh, but now we can give it rows and columns. Um, the rows and columns are visibly how many rows and columns will appear in the box. That does not mean the user is limited to typing this many rows and this many columns. And by the way, the columns are columns of characters. Uh, it's a very old fashioned way of doing things. The internet is kind of old. Um, and things are backwards compatible and things don't get changed sometimes for many, many years. So it's called rows and columns or rows and columns of characters. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be the display width and height. Uh, you can set the width and height instead, uh, instead of rows and columns. It's just common to use rows and columns for the text area. Um, again, this is not going to limit the user to typing that many rows and columns. If they type, uh, the, the columns are gonna be that wide, but the rows, a scroll bar will appear uh, and they can continue to type in however long they want and they can scroll. Uh, you can use CSS to hide the scroll bar. They can still scroll though. Um, you're probably seeing the same thing when you're typing in a comment in Facebook. You can scroll and you can type in longer comments that only show you about three lines. Um, you can put more and you can scroll. This is the same thing. Okay. Uh, next, the select button. This is the drop down box. Okay. Uh, so the way the select starts is select is a name and ID, just like everything else. And then each of the options in that select drop down box are called option. They have a value and then they have a text 
the text is not what gets submitted when the form submits, only the value gets submitted. So you can write capitalization, spacing, write whatever you want. This will be displayed to the user. The value will be hidden from the user, and that's what's going to get submitted uh, when the form submits. That's the same for all the inputs. The value is what gets submitted uh, in, the, in an input text box or a text area. They have values as well. When the user types something in there, those values do get updated uh, by the browser and taken care of for you. There's no programming necessary in that. Um, that's the drop down box. Uh, something in these inputs that I did skip over, you can put placeholders in there as well, or placeholder text in text boxes. Very useful to give the user an idea of what you're expecting the input to be. Okay. Um, those are placeholders. And I have two examples to go through. The first is uh, just an HTML example that I manually typed in, and then uh, we'll go over that. And next, I will go through using Dreamweaver, and we will I will input uh, a form and input some form elements into that, and show you how that works directly in Dreamweaver. Okay, let me get over to Firefox. Okay, um, here is the same essay, a couple extra fields in here. We'll uh, take a look at what those fields look like first, uh, and then we'll have a look at some of the code. Uh, I think I'll just use the code view in the inspector uh, for now. Can you see the, yeah, we can see all that in the recording screen, that's fine. Um, so here I have uh, just the standard h1 at the top so my form goes through everything I have an action which is uh, just the file itself example that htm so my action is not going anywhere I'm not going to actually process this form with any kind of code it's outside of this class uh, I'm using the get method uh, and then these other fields I did not fill in these are uh, uh, the browser put that in there. I did not put that in. Um, we can ignore those. Those are those are done automatically. <clears throat> uh, another thing that uh, was not in the slides is field sets. So you can see the uh, first name, last name, and email address all have this kind of border around there. That is a field set. Uh, field sets can have. Uh, legends in them as well so they can have a little name in there so I could write personal information or contact information here and it'll show up um, actually if I will do that right now and save and reload the file we can have a look at that um, let me type that in uh, there we go legend There we go. Um, so contact info is in the legend. Uh, it's 100% wide, and my blue coloring in there is kind of throwing it off a little bit. Uh, I put the blue coloring in for my benefit and yours. Uh, let me describe what the blue coloring is real quick. Um, the body of this page is blue, uh, and then I have, let me just show you. Uh, right here, every element with the asterisks in there, every element has a slight transparent light blue color layering on top of each other. So as the elements build up, it just is getting darker and darker and darker. Uh, and the form element itself, actually, I told it to have a background color of white. So we can kind of see that. So all the elements are, start off very light blue and they progressively get darker. And that's just so you can see the boundaries of all these elements visually. I don't have to kind of go in and look at each one. So that's where the coloring is. Um, and then this legend, uh, usually it's not 100% wide, but here we go. It's not 100% wide, let me just turn that off actively. The, the field set line goes all the way around and then it stops right at the beginning and the end of the text in the legend and the legends right there. Legends are pretty useful. Uh, 
for field sets. You don't have to have them. I didn't have one until just now, um, and I still don't have one in the lower couple of field sets. Um, they're just a nice way of grouping the field items in there, uh, the input fields. Uh, so the first one, which you can't actually see, is um, if you remember from the slideshow when I was talking about the get parameter, uh, I had secret field in there. Uh, so that's this hidden field, uh, ID of secret field, type is hidden, name again is secret field, and then a value, if you remember from earlier, <clears throat> is 123XYZ. So that's the value you can't, the normal visitor uh, is not going to see this, they're not going to know it's there, they're not going to edit it. Um, through this uh, code inspector, I can type something else in there. Okay, uh, I don't have any JavaScript or anything like that sniffing around on my page, so nothing happens when I change the value, but if I did submit it, that value would be changed uh, from my secret field. So that would be pretty cool. Right? Uh, normally the hidden fields are used, like I mentioned before, um, to display, or not display, but to have information that you want in the, in the form, but that you don't want the user to have anything to do with you want to keep information from the user. Sometimes it can be used for uh, security efforts as well. Um, and, <clears throat> or identifiable information from the user or identifiable information from the actions of the user. Not to identify the user, but to identify the actions the user has taken on your website. Uh, those can be in the hidden fields as well. Um, then I have uh, labels and text inputs fields. So my label with a four of name app goes to the input with the name of name app. That's for the first name. Um, I do have that the first name is required on this form. Uh, and that does not automatically put the asterisks in there. You have to type that in yourself and somehow let the users know that this field is required. That is an accessibility issue. If you're doing any kind of government website, you have to follow accessibility rules and you have to do that. Uh, if you're doing a website for somebody else, uh, you don't have to do that, but it's a really good idea to do so. Uh, you uh, would behoove you, you'd behoove yourself to do so, okay? Uh, let the users know when, uh, uh, when inputs are required from them or optional, so Usually you'll see in a form it says all thing, all fields marked with an asterisk are required. Uh, they may even be red. Uh, this one down here, I have red in here. I think there's an issue with my CSS. This one should be red on the sides as well. Um, so you should uh, note to the user in some way that these fields are required when they are required. Uh, and you can do that with uh, go down to this field set here and click on the text area. Um, so I have the CSS rule right here, text area, colon, required, input, colon, required. So anything that is required, I'm going to get that red border on the left and right. Everything else just has a black border all the way around. Uh, you can customize these borders with CSS, uh, just like any other border. Um, do note that depending uh, the way the browsers work, if they give you a border automatically, and if you define uh, just the left and right border like I did here, and you don't touch the top and bottom, they're going to give you some kind of wonky, old-fashioned, 3D-generated box-looking thing. Um, so if you define one side of the border without defining the others, it's going to look wonky, so you should define all of them. Okay, do, do be aware of that. Um, next, uh, I have an email uh, input in here. Uh, remember this one, it's going to have to look like an email address. Okay, uh, and this is my browser add on right here about logins. I don't have a login for this website. Uh, of course, I don't have a login for this website, but you do have to write an email in the format of an email. Uh, 
Next is the radio button, and that is in its own field set. Again, that's a design uh, choice that I made for this very fun looking um, form. Uh, so you can only click actively on one of these. I have the labels done correctly. So if you click on a label or if you click on the button, okay, you, that's both going to work. And uh, these are put into individual dibs with the label and the input in there and they're floated. Um, and that is to make sure that the radio buttons are displayed properly all exactly where they want because if you just type radio buttons in there uh, you're probably not going to get the display that you want uh, so you do need to kind of force radio buttons and also the check boxes into some sort of display um, however you want them to be uh, and then you should also put like i have a paragraph on top you can use an h2 and h probably you shouldn't use an h1 uh, because it's not a page title, but H2 or below, uh, or a paragraph like I have, uh, to say what this radio group is for, because uh, what the entire group is for, because each individual radio button is going to have its own label, uh, but the group needs some sort of title as well. Um, also of note with radio buttons is, let's have a look here. Okay, type is radio. The name of the radio buttons in a group all have to be the same name as each other. Okay, when they're the same name, they're in the same group and that makes them all work together. Um, you give the IDs to each one different and then the label goes to the ID. That works right. Uh, and then any CSS rules also go to the ID. That's what, that works properly as well, but the name that's what forces them to all be in the same group. When you submit the form, the chosen one gets submitted um, all by the, the name for the radio buttons. Okay, um, And then again, you can write whatever you want for the value. Notice that radio buttons, you know, their label is whatever you want it to be. They're just a dot in there, so you do have to put in a value. You can put the val what the values are, are up to you. Uh, you get to decide what they are. That's fun. <clears throat> Excuse me, losing my voice today. Uh, next, I have check boxes. Uh, they're similar to the radio buttons, um, but in their effect, you can check zero, one, or more of them. Okay, uh, you can have a default check value, like I did in the uh, radio buttons, which I believe was twenty seven to forty. Um, checked is checked. Uh, checked equals checked that uh, you code that in there and that is what's going to power the default somebody can change it later and checked won't equal checked uh, but that is how the default works check equals checked it's a very old system in html originally it was just called checked and as html progressed you had to write check equals checked because the standards had changed if you just write checked in there, browsers are pretty good about backwards compatibility, so it may still work, but that's not going to guarantee, it's not guaranteed to last forever or on all browsers. So uh, the proper way is checked equals checked. Um, back to the check boxes. Okay. Um, same uh, different thing with the check boxes okay they don't work like radio buttons where the radio buttons all have to have the same name the check boxes have their own names and when they're checked off a true false boolean value gets sent with the form submission for whether or not it is checked okay um, so they operate they look very similar to radio buttons. Radio buttons and checkboxes look similar uh, to the user. The only difference is in the radio button, I can only pick one, and then checkboxes, I can pick lots of them. Uh, but programmatically, they're very different. The checkboxes uh, are not grouped together like the radio buttons are, uh, and they submit their values differently. Uh, here I have the select or the drop down box. 
Okay, uh, just like the code that uh, I had in the slides. Whoop, where am I? Here we are. Uh, so I have three options. The first option has no value, and I wrote, please choose an option in there. So they have to click and come into the drop down, and then uh, this is an essay submission, so it's either a work, original work or existing IP. Um, for select boxes, you do have the option of allowing multiple selections. Okay, um, it doesn't always uh, display like this. If it's multiple, it's going to be multi-line, and they're going to scroll, and they can press the control button and click on multiple ones. Um, not all computer users know that they can do that or how to do that. So uh, drop down select boxes nine times out of ten, you're only going to be selecting one thing because that's all the users are aware that they can do. Okay. Um, right here next, I have the range. Okay. Um, I made this up to do a page count, and like I mentioned earlier. Uh, the range does not display a value for you. Okay, you're going to have to do that on your own programmatically, uh, which is why the range isn't used quite that often. I think that's one reason why, anyway. <clears throat> uh, so, page count, small to large for me, whatever, 0 to 100. Um, I did not put a min max value in there into the range, but uh, that is. Uh, the options in there. Let's, let's have a look at ranges really quick. Let's have a look at how they are coded. Uh, so you have a min value, a max value, uh, name, ID, type is range, and then you just slide it like so. Okay. Not too difficult there. Text box, or I'm sorry, text area, I misspoke. Um, Multi-line text input, users can type into here. They can hit the enter button and come with some different lines. As I type in more lines, the scroll bar appears, okay? If I type in a whole lot of characters, it just line wraps all the way around. Okay, so I don't stretch this way, but I do stretch this way. I don't stretch horizontally, but I do stretch vertically. Okay, um, and then the date box, which is very nice here. Okay, date box. I can choose whatever dates. I can hit the X and it goes back to. Um, Back to nothing, month and year selection. Okay. Looks like a common calendar choosing date box. Okay. Uh, and then the password field, I can type something in there. And if I try and copy and paste it into another field, I don't get it. Nope. That is a copy and paste that I had from earlier. Let me, I can copy and paste into a text box, but I cannot copy and paste out of a text box. That's not fair because I had just copied and pasted it. Hold on. Let me, let me not leave that blank because it's a required field. I'm going to type in one, two, three, four, five, what kind of password an idiot would have on their luggage. I will copy and paste it into the last name, okay? And it didn't copy and paste. The last thing that was on my computer's clipboard uh, is what still got copied and pasted because you cannot copy and paste out of a password field. That is a built-in security feature. Um, if I type something into a password field and I get interrupted and I walk away from my computer and then somebody runs over to my computer and thinks they're gonna copy and paste my password out of the field into somewhere else so they can see it, they're mistaken. Password fields do not allow you to do that. That's a that's a big security issue. So you cannot copy out of a password field. Let's have a look at whether or not I can inspect and look at the password field. The value is left blank right here, so I can't see it. Um, I do have 
some information here about this password field that we had seen earlier all the way at the top. Um, and this is some browser password field stuff. Uh, I think it's only on the password field. I don't generally look at the password fields. I just know that they work. Uh, I can hit the reset form button like I mentioned earlier. It sets everything back to default. And I can submit. Um, here's the reset and the submit. Right? It's type reset, type submit. The value is what shows up in the button. Okay. And those are all the uh, common fields that we have uh, for you today. I'm going to have a look at a number of those. Probably all of them. I'll have a look at a bunch of them in Dreamweaver next. Let's switch over to the Dreamweaver screen. There we go. Right, so I have a blank uh, page and uh, I have the same style from my cool blue uh, form that I had just a minute ago. And Let's go ahead and insert and make sure that you can see. Well, I hope you can see that. I don't have two screens. Hopefully you can see what I'm inserting. Um, in the insert toolbar in Dreamweaver, you can choose uh, HTML things to insert, bootstrap things to insert we did a few weeks ago. Uh, and today we'll be inserting form things, okay? Uh, so first you have to insert the form itself, right? So if I insert the form itself, I get this cool little form and it has a border with the rounded edges because I've styled them, okay? Um, right here, I've styled the rounded edges, okay? If I click into the form, I'm in the live view, so I can click on the form uh, and then down way at the bottom, can you see the bottom? Yeah. Down way at the bottom, uh, in the properties toolbar, I can give the form a title, the action, okay, and I can also click the folder and I can browse through the file that is the action. Uh, remember the action from earlier? When the form is submitted, it's going to submit to a URL of some other file that has some function built into it that is going to uh, either retrieve the information from get or post method uh, and then process that information in whichever way the form is to be processed. Either just save it to a database or email it or both or whatever it's gonna do, okay? Uh, just below this, I can change the method between get and post or default. Get is the default if you don't select anything. Uh, I would not recommend selecting, uh, I would not recommend leaving it blank. Always select the one that you want. Um, on the off chance that the default ever changes in the future, or if somebody's using a off-brand browser. Uh, in coding type, which we have not talked about yet, um, multi-part form data and application X www form URL encoded. Uh, the multi-part form data is the choice you would choose if you were uploading files. Um, this part you can leave uh, as the default. You can leave it blank uh, unless you need it. You don't need to set this to anything, okay? So we'll leave it blank because we're not doing uh, advanced forms. Uh, the target, well, we don't use target in, in forms generally. We can skip that. And character set. Uh, if you have to set a character set, if you know for some reason you have to set the char set to either ISO or UTF, uh, do so. Otherwise, it's common to leave those blank as well. Uh, give it an ID. My cool form. Okay, this is going to be a CSS ID. It's also going to be used for any on page. JavaScript that runs and tries to access the form. This is a great way to identify which form you're accessing because it's not entirely uncommon to have more than one form on a page. Uh, if a website has a search bar, that's probably a form. And then if they have 
somewhere down below, sign up for our newsletter. That's a form, so you can never assume that there's only one form on a page. Forms are in more places than you might think. Um, turn on and off autocomplete for your browser's autocomplete. Uh, if you're doing autocomplete and you have something like first name, last name, email, and that thing, use uh, common terminology for their names and IDs in that. You may have accessed a form before where the autocomplete didn't quite fill things in all the way. Uh, it's because they used uh, uncommon uh, names and IDs in their form fields. You can choose to do that on purpose, uh, or you can choose to use common ones so that the autofill works better. Uh, let's go ahead and insert some uh, form items in here. Okay, I'm going to start with the simplest text input. So I input my text input. I am already selected into the form. Of, uh, so when I input my text, I'm going to click nest inside of it. Okay. Um, by default, I'm going to have it drawn already the way because I already have my styling for labels and inputs. And if you'll see down here, Dreamweaver gives me my label with a core value of text field and the name for my input is text field. Also the ID is as well. Like I mentioned, that was very common uh, and for those to be the same. Um, so it already is linked together. Uh, Dreamweaver is gonna remember this link because it's written right there in text so Dreamweaver doesn't have to store it anywhere. Uh, when I click on this input field, and if I go down into the properties here, if I change the name, I'm going to change it to first name, hit enter, and have a look at the label, it gets updated as well. So Dreamweaver is going to do that for you. All right, very useful. Um, it also kept the ID the same as well. Uh, so those are not strictly required, but Dreamweaver is going to force us into it anyway which is fine because I always make them the same anyhow. Uh, you can give it a size and a max length. I mentioned before, uh, you can force a max length on text fields, uh, which is very useful, especially in older systems where, uh, or in any system where the database value, if you're saving to a database, if you know that your name text field is limited to 20 characters, you can limit this with a max length to 20 characters as well. You're still going to need to sanitize it and check it later because it, all this exists on the user side and users can go into their uh, editor just like you and I can and they can change this max length and then type in more characters. So you cannot trust user input ever. Uh, but we're all on the front end right now. So I digress. Um, <clears throat> placeholder, I'll put my name as the placeholder and have a look that it is grayed out. So the placeholder is grayed out when I click into it. Um, actually, I'll have to go to the browser. Let me go back to my Firefox browser. Um, Copy and paste my URL and go to the form we're working on right now. So I have the placeholder of my first name. Uh, it's grayed out text. If I click in there and start typing, it immediately disappears. I don't have, I can't drag and delete it. I can't click and I can't delete backspace. None of that works. It's a placeholder. It's visually there only as soon as I type in one character. It, is, it becomes invisible, it's no longer there. As soon as I erase all the characters, it becomes visible again. It's only a, a visual placeholder for the user so they can see what you expect them to input in that box. Okay, uh, I could come over to the label. Remember, the label's for value updated automatically for us, but the label itself did not, so I have to type that. And I missed the letter. All right, so the label itself is there. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and insert another text box for last name. This one's going to be after because I'm selected on the previous text box. Uh, so click on that. 
change its name to last name, change the label to say last name, I hit enter inside the label. Don't want to do that. Um, I also want to change the placeholder to, we'll put my last name in there. Okay. <clears throat> there are those. Uh, what was the next? We'll go to email next. Insert that after. Okay. Email is already going to have the label say email. That's helpful. All right. The name is already going to be email as well. That's helpful. We'll give it a placeholder of name at gmail.com. Okay. Actually, we'll call it, yeah, name at gmail.com is pretty good because a lot of people have their name. That's very useful. We can force it to be, hmm, let me skip that. Not going over that part. Um, we can force a tab index for folks that want to tab through. Uh, if you leave the tab index blank, tabbing is going to naturally progress through, but you can force an alternative tab index uh, if you choose to do so, and you just count the numbers through that. Um, if you're doing a tab index, don't do it until the whole layout is all done, because if you move something around, you have to redo the whole thing because you have to count them all over again. Uh, so with the name being email, I want to insert another email field after this one. And this one is going to be called email2. Dreamer, you're going to call the first one email, the next one email2, OK? Uh, note for future reference. We'll put in a password field, okay, just to insert password. Put inside the password field, name is password, placeholder, one, two, three, four, five, okay, placeholder in the password field is one, two, three, four, five. If I save this and refresh into the browser, make sure you can see my browser. Okay, so the password field is one, two, three, four, five. But as soon as I start typing, it's still an actual password field. Okay, um, so a little bit funny that the placeholder in a password field gives you a value, but you'll never actually see a value. That's a little bit funny, but still works fine. Next, we will insert a, let's insert a color choice. Do that after the password. Okay, I have a color choice with something I didn't code previously, but we'll put one in right now. Uh, we'll do a date next. Put that after the color. All right, save that. These are all pretty simple. I can change the names if I want. Uh, let's head into the browser and have a look at what the Color field does when I click on it. Hopefully you can see. No, I'm sorry. Um, my screen grabber is not going to grab this for you, but it does open up the uh, system color dialog box. Okay. Um, so my screen recorder doesn't show you the pop up box for that. I'm sorry, it's just not going to work for me. Um, but hopefully you know what the system color chooser looks like. You have the all the, the square with all the colors going from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Um, and I'm on Windows, so I also have some default color options chosen chosen on there. Um, that's that's the system uh, default for me. Uh, if you're on a different uh, operating system, yours will look slightly different. Uh, but it's going to be the default one for your system. Uh, we went over the date. Uh, it doesn't operate any differently this way. Uh, 
I want to do a radio button in Dreamweaver. Let me open up a different, uh, actually click here. I want to put in a field set and then a radio button. Uh, so field set down here, um, put it after the date. You can give it a legend now or not. I want to call it radio choice because that's what I want to put inside of it. Okay, so I have that. It's once you have a legend and you have nothing in the field set, the you have to click just below the legend to get to the field set. Um, or if you click and you get the legend, remember down here is kind of the breadcrumb trail of all your uh, choices all the way up to body. Uh, so you can click on field set and get the field set. Um, now I'm going to insert a radio group. Okay, uh, You can insert just a radio button. I don't want to insert one button. I want to insert a group of buttons and Dreamweaver is going to give me a dialog box with some options for it. Okay, um, I'm going to do nest in the field set because I'm selected in the field set. And now here's my dialog box. So radio group one, I'm fine with that name for now. Uh, value, I'm gonna call it uh, opt one, opt two, <clears throat> and I'm gonna add another one and call it opt three. Uh, those are the labels for each one and then values of one, two, and three. Very simple. Um, layout using line breaks or a table. Um, I would recommend line breaks, but it really depends on what uh, looks like for your design, what can I fit in there. Um, let me go ahead and add one more. Call this Ops 4 and do a value of 4 and put in another. Call this Other. Other. Uh, I'm going to stick to the numbers and call that one zero. Okay. So then when I'm ready, I select OK. Actually, I want other to be first. I'm going to click this up arrow, or if I want other to go back down, I can click on this down arrow and put it down there. Uh, and when I'm ready, I select OK. And Dreamweaver is going to build all that and put it in there. Um, the styling is still the same as before, because remember, I do have my CSS style. Um, and you can have a look at that in the example when I post it after I finish recording this. <clears throat> I'm just going to put all those in there. Uh, and a quick look at the code there put in very much like I had before, except uh, yeah, Dreamweaver puts a paragraph tag on all of them and then uses line breaks. When I did it, I used div tags. Okay. Very similar, only difference. Okay, so I have. All that. Let's have a look at save that and go back to my browser and refresh. All right, so I have my radio choice and my field set looks a little different on this one. Maybe my um, <clears throat> maybe my CSS rules are not perfect. Let's inspect my field set and see what is funny here. Field set, border. Ah, Dreamweaver inserted some bootstrap stuff for me. And if I get rid of that, then uh, then then it looks normal again. So it looks like Dreamweaver did some stuff for me without my asking again with regard to bootstrap. Uh, it's done that before on me. Okay, I like Bootstrap, but I don't like Dreamweaver taking over for me. What are we going to do? Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, uh, so I have, <clears throat> so, excuse me, I have this field set. I'm going to insert another field set after. This field set is near the bottom. Field set, uh, no legend this time. Okay. Oh, it inserted the field set right where my cursor was in the, in the code area. I don't want that. I want to click on this field set 
down in the bottom in my breadcrumb area. Insert a field set. Now it's going to ask me if I want before or after. I can't wrap it or nest it. So yes, nest it, no legends this time. All right, now I have another field set and I'm already selected on it. And now I want to put in a, not a checkbox. Where is the select? There it is, right above uh, the regular button. So I put the select in the field set, so nest it in there. So I have a select. Uh, so the radio button, when I insert the radio button group, I get the options immediately to fill it in. Uh, alternatively, I could have inserted all the radio buttons individually. That's not nearly as fun because then I have to type in more stuff on my own and Dreamweaver won't do it for me. Uh, the select button, I don't get a select button group. That's not a thing. So I insert a select. I just get the select in the drop down. Uh, when I click on it, in my properties window, properties pane in Dreamweaver, I get this button that says list values. I click on that and now I get a similar dialog box that we've had with the radio buttons and I can type in all the item labels. Uh, one value one, I can hit, I can add more just like I did with the radio buttons. Okay, option one and two or other values here and okay. Uh, and then all right, one, op two, and other. So the select button, cooler probably than the radio button, the drop down in here. Uh, and I can much more easily add things later on because that opens up the radio buttons, radio button group, Dreamweaver is not quite as nice about adding things later on. Uh, so I have to individually add them one at a time afterwards. Uh, I can also default what is selected right there in the um, <clears throat> in the select properties panel. So I'll save and have a quick look in the browser and see this one. I have my option here. It was automatic. Option two was automatically selected because that so I pressed in there. If I refresh the page, right? I refresh the page, it still goes back to option one because your browser remembers what you had just selected. It's part of the autofill response. Okay. But if I put a reset button, we do that. Uh, what was it? Where's reset after? It's going to be called default by uh, reset by default. Uh, we don't have to do anything to this one. And I'm going to input a submit button after the reset. Submit button. The name or the value says button type button name button ID button. That's a little weird, right? Now it's like a regular button. Maybe I let me, maybe I pressed the wrong button. Let's insert a submit button again. There, I pressed the wrong button. Okay, I pressed button button. Um, you can have multiple buttons in your forms. You can use JavaScript to make them do other things. Um, it's primarily what the gener generic button is for. Okay, uh, the submit button, I have some options down here. Uh, I can change the, uh, the form action and the form method in the submit button. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I would leave that as submit. Um, it might be interesting to put two submit buttons, one via get and one via post, but you don't want to give your users that kind of control. Most of them aren't going to know what that is anyway. Um, and therefore, it's, it's just not going to be a good idea for them. Uh, but that's a submit button. Let me get, it, get rid of this button button. Uh, delete that. So I have a reset button and a submit button. I'm going to save the page with the reset button. Have a look at that in the browser. Because <clears throat> remember, I made that choice in the select. 
uh, and it's still selected even though I refresh the page again, but I'm going to hit reset and it's going to go back to the default. Uh, so these are all the common input choices. Um, I think I skipped text area. Um, that's okay. Skip the text area. Let's go back to here. Okay. Uh, so that's forms uh, and form actions and methods and uh, most of the inputs, all the common ones we went over, uh, labels for those inputs, text areas, select boxes, radio buttons, check boxes, uh, password fields, lots of cool stuff in there. Um, we shall be familiar with the reason for forms, a common reason for them anyhow. Um, and that's forms. So that is uh, week 14. Uh, next week, I do not have uh, a lecture for you, but I do plan on having um, a live uh, video on Blackboard for anyone that wants any assistance uh, for their final project, the resume version 3, uh, responsive version. Uh, so during our normal class time, Tuesday, um, starting at six o'clock um, if nobody uh, joins in i probably am not going to sit around all the way uh, through to nine o'clock um, so uh, do get there early uh, or not at all your choice is not a requirement um, if you don't need any assistance with it you don't have any questions about any of the previous uh, chapters that we covered i know that uh, since we've not been meeting in class, you've not had uh, the same kind of opportunities to ask questions. So if you have any uh, next Tuesday and the last Tuesday of, uh, of our class as well, the last two weeks, I'll be doing a live uh, video via Blackboard um, at our normal class time. Uh, so if you have any questions for me, show up for that time. Um, if you don't do anything after today, it will be uh, the final project. Um, I generally have the last second to last class open to work on it and the last class is for presenting. Uh, we won't be doing presenting uh, so you'll have that same time period to work on your final project again. Okay, uh, so you guys have a great week and maybe I'll see you on Tuesday.